afternoon we uh, we have permission from my childhood friend good friend today as well Craig Taubman who's a wonderful musician to use his music uh, before when we're warming up or waiting so people aren't bored and that is uh, Craig's rendition together with Josh Nelson of Psalm 150 the last psalm in the book of Psalms uh, it's, it's a lovely, lovely song. It's from a, it's from a number of years now. It's not new, not new in any case. So he's still putting out music from time to time. And uh, there's a link to that in the chat box if you'd like to listen to it afterwards. So um, I hope everybody is well. Um, I feel a little... Um, uh, not out of my league, but uh, taken on too much for today. Repentance, uh, Steve had asked me to talk about repentance in the Jewish tradition, early Jewish tradition, and it's it's such a huge topic. When I began to um, to look for sources, literary sources, which is our way, I think, our, our, our chosen way of doing things, um, it, it was not easy. And so I brought a lot of stuff. We're not going to read all of it. We sent out the three pages uh, yesterday. Uh, we're going to read some of it. But in looking through the material, some of which I remembered in my head, certain key words like lashuv, to return, tshuva, which is a noun constructed from that, that verb, shuv, um, uh, which has been translated mostly as repentance, but maybe better as return. Not exactly the same thing. Um, that's certainly the theme of Acts, uh, of Acts three, and 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 the and the sermon. Uh, but um, there's different aspects of it. Some of them I remembered myself. Some I kind of looked up and was brought to other texts. I, I was looking for one particular, a, a good rabbinic text which would encapsulate all those things, and I didn't find it. Instead, I found two texts that I think might be relevant. One of them as a polemic. And the other as just kind of a, um, oh, and, and a very shortened, but a, from a very long section in the Talmud that deals with tshuva, deals with different aspects of tshuva, returning or repentance. Um, and one of the major takeaways that I have from rabbinic literature is that it, it, it is talking about individuals and not a community. Whereas much of prophetic literature was talking about the community itself, and our passage in Acts 3 is talking about a community. True, made up of individuals, but a lot of the talk about Chuvan rabbinic literature is about the individual who has strayed from the way and what needs to be done. And a lot of it, of course, is ceremonial and ritual, having to do with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But of all the passages that I was looking at, it struck me that the third or the end, the ending part of Malachi or Malachi, I think you might say, uh, one of the latest, if not the latest prophet that we have in the 12 minor prophets, a prophet from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, probably uh, linguistically a little bit earlier, but feels like he's writing um, let's say around the year 500, maybe even a little bit later, but probably around the year 500 BCE, um, 
to me, that kind of gives maybe a background of what we might be looking at today, if that's all right. Um, but I jumped right into it. Steve, did you have anything you wanted to say about last week or, or to, to, you know, to, as a segue? Well, just um, are we going to get into the text, uh, uh, chapter three? But we, we kind of did that last week, I thought. Is, is there more that you wanted to add to that? Well, just that section on uh, Peter's call for repentance. So, so let's begin with that. Let's begin by going back to that in the text. So, for that, I loved, I loved what you posted the the, the Malachi and and the other, and I think they're really very close in in, in some of those uh, instances that that I wanted to call upon in just a minute. But I just wanted to root this in that in that one passage. Okay, then, so I, since I, I, I neglected to put that on the same page, uh, uh, let's see, uh, how do we, um, what's the best way of doing this? Um, give me just a moment and I'll, I'll, I'll call up last week's uh, text sheet and then we'll use, we'll use it from that. If you have last week's text sheet handy, please go ahead and... and uh, throw it out. That's all right. Well, I mean, we'll put it, we'll throw, up on the, we'll throw it up on the screen in just a moment, please. Hold on. Really, it's uh, that chapter 3, verse 17, and down. Okay, just a moment. We're almost there. Okay. And Can now, and now okay. brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers in this way god fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his messiah would suffer repent therefore and turn to god so that your sins may be wiped out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God had announced long ago through his holy prophets. So I just wanted to look at the uh, that text, uh, verse 19, repent therefore, which comes up again and again. And I think just like in um, Okay, we seem to have a, a connection problem that, with that Greek word for. Hang on, it, are y'all having a hard time with my connection? Correct. Hey, let me go to another spot. I'll be right back. Okay. When I have no connection back there. Here I am. Oh, I got it. I got it right here. All right. Sorry about that. So, metanus, which gets translated repent, is uh, from that Greek word nous, uh, the mind. Or really, as I think Paul uses it, and I think the New Testament tradition uses it, it's, uh, it functions like the eye of the heart. And um, as Paul prays in, in uh, Ephesians, may the eyes of your hearts be enlightened. And the heart is, of course, that centered it's, it's where the personality is. It's, it's, it's the center of the being. And at the very center of the heart, the cardia, is the noose, the, the eye of the heart. And pride closes it. And humility opens it. And when it's closed, the heart hardens. 
and 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 no one else can get in when the heart when the eye of the heart is closed then holy spirit or the spirit of the other can't get in and um and so i think when i when i understand metanus i i think i translate it in my head open your heart open the eye of your heart so that spirit with spirit can meet and power can flow and uh, when we're cut off from Holy Spirit, from the spirit of the other, much like in Malachi and Hosea and the, the other texts that David posted, it's like rend your hearts, break your hearts open, uh, is, is said in, in certain places. So uh, that, that's, that's the point I wanted to bring to this table, and, and we'll see where that goes, but that, that was what I wanted to contribute. Great. And, th and that, of course, is what we're talking about. We're talking about this text in Acts and, and what might be happening around that time, those listening, and those hearing and those reading afterwards, the, this scene in Acts or, this, or these particular scenes in Acts that are playing out as the church, the early church begins to form. Um, so, uh, and of course, a lot of what, what we're doing now is total supposition because because there's nobody linking the things together necessarily but um but that that's kind of my idea of what we might do today is to look at some of these texts not all of them and to say okay what were jews hearing at the time what were they thinking perhaps at the time when jesus was active uh, on the temple in the temple because all this is taking place in the temple that i can say with with i think with, uh, with some degree of certainty that the author here wants us to think of what Jesus was doing in the temple. This is not about Jesus walking around in, in the northern part in the Galil. Uh, he's brought us to the temple in the storytelling now so that we think of Jesus in the temple as well. That I'm pretty certain about that. And um, and so that kind of fueled the, the choice. So if um, I don't think that we need to read all of, of Malachi, but if I could have um, perhaps somebody read uh, a 5 to 7. Let's start with that. Volunteer. Malachi 3, 5 to 7. I can do that. Please, go ahead. Okay. Um, but first, I will step forward to contend against you, and I will act as a relentless accuser against those who have no fear of me, who practice sorcery, who commit adultery, who swear falsely, who cheat laborers of their hire, and who subvert the cause of the widow, orphan, and stranger, said the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord. I have not changed. Oh, and, you about Trump. <laughs> and you are the children of Jacob. You have not ceased to be. From the very days of your fathers, you have turned away from my laws and have not observed them. Turn back to me, and I will turn back to you, said the Lord of hosts. But you ask, how shall we turn back? So this is a key text when it comes to tshuva in the Jewish tradition, right? Turning back, uh, it, it, God hasn't changed. The Lord hasn't changed. The, and so lashu means to return to the same place. Now, of course, we think of religion very differently. I think that God is constantly changing as human, human, humanity is changing. Interpretations are changing. But, but still, that's the idea here. You've turned away and you need to get back on track. Um, the sins that are listed here are both theological and sociological, or, or it, it, you know, you've got uh, things against God, no fear of me, but the b majority of the things here seem to be sins against other human beings. In other words, not, not, um, not having a just society. Okay, and then um, could, you, could you continue to read from 16 to 18 for us, please? In this vein, have those who revere the Lord been talking to one another? The Lord has heard and noted it, and a scroll of remembrance has been written at his behest concerning those who revere the Lord and esteem his name. And on the day that I am preparing, said the Lord of hosts, they shall be my treasured possession. I will be tender toward them as a man is tender toward a son who ministers to him. And you shall come to see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between him who has served God and him who has not served him. 
And it, to me, this sounds, this is echoing, or Peter is echoing this verse. Maybe not specifically this verse, but it's this idea here. And I like this one, and I, 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 I boldened it because it has the, 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 the image of the Son and the Father here as well, used differently, of course, but, but still. Um, uh, this idea that this is remembered, there's this ongoing scorecard, and, and that's what Peter's talking about here. You guys messed up the scorecard. You got a lot of demerits. You got a lot of negative points. You got a lot of bad grades. You got to do makeup session. This is this is a time for you to to do your makeup session and get it right this time. Stephen, any reactions of after looking at those two verses? Yeah, I think um, in Malachi, which which I take was was about four hundred BC, BCE, and 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 the last of the uh like you said david the last of the prophets to speak but then you fast forward 400 years uh to in in the malachi text that you gave us ends with elijah right that elijah is coming and so you fast forward 400 years to john the baptist on the judean desert and he's dressed like elijah right with the belt and the camel's hair with the eye and he's calling for repentance so it seems to me he's in that line of of malachi and that the new testament writers let's say matthew in this case are connecting those dots so that time is is here that great day is upon us yeah and so prepare get ready this is a um a well-known passage in jewish circles because it comes up in our liturgy um uh, twice i think as this as the prophetic re reading during the year um, and and people will remember this because of uh, of this imagery of, of of Elijah. What does Elijah say? You know, when Elijah will come, the harbinger of the Messiah. Of course, that's that's the idea in, in the New Testament and the Gospels as well. But um, this idea of Heshiv Lev Avot Al Banim and the 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 sons will 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 work it out with their fathers. Again, this imagery of father fa father and child, parent and child. And, and that's a prerequisite for things getting better, for the return is a, um, a proper relationship between parents. And you could go either way with this. You could say a proper relationship between parents, according to the early churches, to understand that in this case, God's son is part of God and set aside. And therefore, we as, as mere human beings need to relate to this, this, this entity, Jesus, differently. Or you could take the non-Christian side of it to say, no, the proper relationship between parents and children is that there's a parent, God, and there's children is not the same. One, it could go, what I'm trying to do is to set maybe what might have been the stage of what was going on in the rhetoric of the time. Don't know if I'm successful or not. Don't know if it's, if it's even close to what was historically true, but at least to me gives kind of a setting, a setting in life for what, what Peter is saying. Any reactions from the folks before we go on? Yes, Donald. I just want to point out to everybody that that word uh, cardiac spelled with a K. I thought it was spelled with a C, you know, cardiology, um, but it's with a K if anybody's interested in Googling it. Well, I think even though it's with a K, it does give us the word cardiology. <laughs> with a C, I think I think it's the same word, Donald. Yeah, um, and and it, which also gives us the word caritas, right? Is also related to that. Correct? Am I correct in that, Stephen? I think so. Yep, I think so. Caritas is in charity, right? Okay. Um, so, Donald, do you want to read for us the? We're, we're going from the la la latest of the prophets to one of the early prophets. Yeah, really one of the early prophets, not of Judah, but of Israel, of the northern tribes. That's Hosea. Would you read that passage for us, Donald? Surely. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have fallen because of your sin. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all guilt and accept what is good. Instead of bulls, we will pay 
the offering of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. No more will we ride on steeds, nor ever again we will call our handiwork our God, since you alone orphans find pity. I will heal their affliction generously. I will take them back in love, for my anger has turned away from them. This is kind of the classical picture image of tshuva. What it means to is is to is to get back to the real. In other words, people might have been doing the right thing, but they weren't meaning and intending the right thing, uh, and and they were missing the point. So this this is kind of what you find in most most uh, when it's talking about the public themselves, right? The people themselves, it's they've strayed from the way, and not about a particular episode. That would be my point. And not a particular thing that one thing happened, an event happened that you all need to repent for, which is kind of what Peter is saying. Maybe that Peter's saying that, or maybe Peter's just saying in general, you missed the point again. The point has morphed into something else, being Jesus's presence. Um, I don't know. How, how, how would you react to that, Stephen? Well, I think, um, at, like you said, uh, there, there's a ritual surface uh, uh, repentance and then there's that inner uh deep repentance that i i say is the um opening of the eye of the heart and when the eye of the heart is closed by pride and the heart hardens then we cannot act justly right and and just justice from that greek word the kayasune is 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 technically right relationship you know, our relationship is, is truncated. When the heart is shut down, then all we have is our own self-interest and our own advantage. We seek our own advantage. We can't act mercifully or with justice. So I, I think that's, that's the point. It's like uh, Peter is saying uh, the rulers, like rulers in every age of any system, of any religion, when it gets to this kind of hypocris hypocritical uh, relationship to God, which serves only one's self-interest or the interest of the team, then uh, victims get hurt. You know, we, we, do we do great damage. We neglect the orphans and the widows and the poor. So I think it's, it's part, I love how this stream is flowing, David, and I think uh, this is in line with that. Um, so, so Jeremiah is, uh, you know, is, is uh, the, the famous prophet of Judah, of Jerusalem, and uh, right before the, or at the time of the destruction in 586. Um, no need to read that, I think. But also, you know, we find lots of ideas, of course, not in the mouths of the prophets per se, but in the poetry, in the liturgy of ancient times. And here we have an example from Psalm 51, which I think maybe in your tradition might be Psalm 50. I know there's, you know, from time to time there's a difference, but but uh, but uh, could, could somebody read from Psalm 51 for us? Sid, go ahead, Sid. Just unmute first. For I recognize my transgressions and am ever conscious of my sin. Against you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are just in your sentence and right in your judgment. Save me from blood guilt, O God, God my deliverer, that I may sing forth your beneficence. O Lord, open my lips and let my mouth declare your praise. You do not want me to, to bring sacrifices. You do not desire burnt offerings. True sacrifice to God is a contri contrite spirit. God, you will not despise a contrite spirit and crushed heart. May it please you to make Zion prosper. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will want sacrifices offered in righteousness, burnt and whole offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Now, I don't know what to do about the bulls will be offered in the last line, but it seems to me that this could have been very much being reinterpreted at the end 
or the destruction of the second temple. This was this echoes the destruction of the first temple. Um, but this th these are the things I think might be in the background, especially because of save me from blood guilt. There's blood guilt. The people have blood guilt. And what Jesus was preaching in the temple was, and around the temple and in those, those stories that we have in the Gospels, was again, the people are missing the point. This, this building is not going to last, right? This time next year, it'll be gone, whatever the, the, that, that particular story says. And, um, and, and, and again, I imagine in my fantasy, in my rabbinic fantasy, I imagine perhaps this was the psalm that, that's in the background, that's being sung that day in the temple. Uh, or in the background of Peter when Peter's giving, or the author who after the destruction of the temple is giving these words, putting these words into Peter's mouth, um, maybe maybe something appropriate. Comments or, or questions? Yes, Donald. Um, I, to me, this hits on two levels. Um, and the, the one level that it misses is the reflection of the individual person and the regret and the um, confession of, of the wrong and to avoid whatever it is that's causing um, this separation from God. So, I, I, I mean, that's what I think our, these passages are, are missing. Well, I would say, to, to that point, I would say, but I think that's what Peter, Peter's not talking to the individual. Uh, to me, it feels like Peter's talking to the community, right? Yeah. So it's not, and, and so the community, and, and it's not so much a confession, but uh, it's, well, I guess it's, it's, con it's accepting, accepting what you, what you missed when you asked for Jesus to be killed instead of the thief, then, then I, you need to, you need to get on board otherwise, and those are the things that are coming up after, or, um, or that we had also Malachi that I think I skipped over. Um, I think I think that's what that's why to me this this in other words the as aspects of chuva which are very private. There's aspects of chuva which are public, um, and and while most of rabbinic law deals with the private, some does do the public. I wasn't didn't find anything particularly productive there, but I'll tell you in a second about a particular tractate in the Talmud that deals with public mistakes and chuva. Um, but I, I think I, to me this was kind of the 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 bridge between that that private world of chuva and the public. I don't know. That's I hear what you're saying though. And we might say that Peter is speaking a truth to power, right? Uh, he he is. So you acted in in ignorance. You thought you were doing good in God's name, but lo and behold you killed an innocent person and and because of blindness we we didn't you didn't recognize that this was a precious child of god and and so i think there's that that piece there there, there is blood on your hands and yet uh it happens all the time in every generation and so we we have to speak that truth and remind folks what what right relationship looks like and uh, without that, we we just act on our own interest over and over again. Anybody else before we go on? Now, we we brought up before already in our study of Acts, Joel, the prophet Joel, and and uh, to me this plays right into what Steve was saying in the beginning of our study today about about the heart. And the hardening or the, the sealing of the heart is Joel 2.13. Rend your hearts rather than your garments and turn back to the Lord your God. For God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and renouncing punishment. Um, and so uh, it, this isn't exactly, um, yeah, this, I mean, this is not what Peter's saying exactly, but perhaps in the background as well, as long as since we've already established that Joel was part of the, part of the thinking, I think. Um, all right, so so we go now to a, a, a passage from the Midrash, which Midrash Tanchuma, while being late, second half of the first millennium of the Common Era, uh, echoes and gives us kind of a snapshot of what was going on in synagogues 
in in the ancient in, in the land of Israel in the first part of the millennium when when uh, in Babylonian Jewry there were no sermons on Shabbat morning the homily was not part of the liturgy was not part of the service they read a much larger part of the Torah they wanted to finish the Torah every year and read the whole thing consecutively so they had a much larger chunk what would be three sometimes four or five chapters in in the way it was broken down in the Middle Ages uh, a week and so there was no time in the Babylonian um, in the first millennium, millennium, there was no time for for sermons. Uh, sermons were a thing uh, of of the land of Israel, of Palestine, and 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 we have that in the Gospels as well, where where, where Jesus participates in that in that action of getting up and speaking about the text they read was a much shorter text, and it took them three and a half years to finish the reading of the Torah. The reading was consecutive from Genesis to the end of of, of Deuteronomy, but it took them three and a half years. Uh, so there was time for a sermon and also for poetry. That's I don't know if we'll get to that, but ancient poetry, which would, a poet would go from village to village, from city to city, and would incorporate the Torah reading and what was happening in the world that day into his poetry, which were the prayers. Really interesting prayers that would change from week to week, and we have we have evidence of that, uh, literary evidence of that. But betting back to Midrash Tanhuma. Um, although compiled in, in its literary form late, it does reflect an oral tradition of sermons. And it, when I saw this, it seemed to me that perhaps this is a polemic uh, against what was happening in the Christian world. I can't say any more than that. It would be irresponsible of me, but so I emphasize the word perhaps. Uh, Richard, would you read this uh, section from Tanhuma? Come and see the difference between righteous and wicked, even as it is stated in Malachi 3.18. Then you shall again see the difference between righteous and wicked. It is comparable to a certain uh, matron who had an Ethiopian bondmaid. Now, her husband went to a country overseas. All night, the bondmaid said to the matron, I am fairer than you, and the king loves me more than you. The matron said to her, when the morning comes, we shall know who is fairer and whom the king loves. Similarly, do the nations of the world say to Israel, as for us, our deeds are more beautiful and in us does the Holy One delight. Therefore, Isaiah has said, when the morning comes, we shall know in whom the Holy One delights. As stated in Isaiah 20, uh, 21, 12, the watchman said, the morning comes. When the world to come arrives, which is called morning, then according to Malachi 3.18, you shall again see the difference between righteous and wicked. And Peter is talking about this coming of time of knowing between the righteous and the wicked. And so Peter's uh, understanding is that those that will accept Jesus as the Son of God, they'll be in the camp of the righteous, and the other will be the others will be in the camp of the wicked. By the way, just talking about in Peter's context, just the, the Jewish community, I think, right? Not, I think, I, I, I'm sure. Um, whereas Tanhuma is is putting it and giving this problematic parable, I get, especially when the the, the the better manuscript says adds the word Ethiopian, um, and, and there's issues there of race and color that uh, this is not the place to go into, but are on our minds in other contexts today. Um, what does it mean? But it's kind of like this. It's it's reminiscent of, of Hagar of Hagar um, uh, not being respectful of Sarah. You know she gets uppity according to the biblical text because she becomes pregnant from Abraham, and I'm better. Aha, I'm better than you are. That kind of a thing, uh, and um, and 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 maybe this is a polemic of sorts with with those Jews. In their world, in the synagogue said, "Listen, we're 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 better. Our tradition is better, is more fair, in, in than than the than the older one, right? Than the, than the older wife, than the uh, the people themselves. And the reason I only think this is because if Malachi was in the background uh, of these kinds of conversations, then this would be the hook. I think that that would be the hook into into giving that kind of interpretation. What do you guys think?" I have a feeling maybe I, I, I as I said, I, I apologetic in the beginning, I think I, f I feel a little bit of, uh, out of, it's above my head, above my pay grade, some of this uh, 
the study today. I, I don't feel totally uh, in control of, uh, of the material as I often do. Of, of what piece in particular? Well, no, the whole thing. I mean, it, it just feels, <laughs> I feel more grounded when there's a particular text and we're going through and then we have an idea, but this is such a huge topic. And if, if, if I do see our study as trying to understand the roots of the, of, 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 of the growing apart and to try to, to somehow in our time to make peace with that growing apart um, is, is, is this attempt to try to sense of what, what was coming apart at the time. What were, I understand what Peter was saying to his people. Yeah, I understand that. But what was happening to the rest of the Jewish people of the time, who in that time still were the vast majority, what were they thinking? How were they reacting? And what did that cause? That, that's kind of, that, that's where I'm going. And of course, we're at a lot because this is a late, if this was a first, second century source, and I would say from Jerusalem, I would say, come on, that's got to be talking about that kind of thing. But of course, that would be irresponsible from an academic point of view for me to say something like that. So that's why I'm feeling, um, I'm yeah, feeling that's unsure. Good. That's very, very fine. I get it. Um, also, I'm looking around. We're not getting too. I'm not eliciting too many. There's not too many reactions today, so I have a feeling that perhaps this is too um, up in the air. Uh, so, but anyway, we're committed. We dove in, and 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 now we get to the. If the part until now was difficult, now it gets even in some ways rougher because the Talmud, as I think I've explained before, the Talmud is a collection of traditions of oral traditions that was compiled in the 6th century, beginning, say, of the 6th century. And there's two Talmuds. There's the one of the land of Israel, which we call the Jerusalem Talmud, which had nothing to do with Jerusalem, because by the time, the mid uh, after the 2nd century uh, CE, Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem. The Romans wouldn't let them back in Jerusalem. So it's called the Jerusalem Talmud because it's the Talmud of the land of Israel. Very often, Jerusalem was a catchphrase for things of the land of Israel, especially diaspora, not especially, in the diaspora, when somebody referred to something from the land of Israel, in the first millennium, or maybe even in, in the beginning of the second millennium, they said, well, that's from Jerusalem, even though it wasn't physically from Jerusalem. Okay, so the Jerusalem Talmud is a collection of traditions, which is different than the Babylonian Talmud. There's overlap, but it's different because the Jerusalem Talmud deals with also the, the laws of the land of Israel, which are agricultural laws. In Babylonia, those laws didn't apply because they were in the diaspora. And so there's a different outlook on many things. But it's the Babylonian Talmud which became the main vessel of Jewish tradition, what became Judaism, normative Judaism. That, that, that was the main, that was the vessel that held all those oral traditions from, from 500, 600 years, if you include even the first century BCE, um, that, that somebody or a group of people, rabbis, edited in the 6th century, maybe even the 7th century, as if it was one conversation happening, they're all kind of in, the, in one big study hall. Not exactly, because it says it goes from place to place, but, and very often it's a um, it's, um, uh, stream of conscious. It, not very, it's very, more often than not, a stream of conscious. It's based on the Mishnah, which is a compilation of oral traditions from around the year 200, from the northern, from the Galilee. And those are almost all entire, almost all of it is law, is, is what you do. And then the Talmud takes apart each of those paragraphs and, and then says, okay, well, what do we do today? What is the tradition of how exactly done? What if, what if this case, which wasn't exactly mentioned in the law above, and so on, and, and, and kind of trickles down. But then sometimes it goes into issues of not of action itself, but of, of theology, of philosophy, of what we're thinking, what we're feeling, of emotions. Um, and so uh, the, the, the Talmud is, based, is, is broken down into tractates, as the Mishnah was. And one tractate that I mentioned before and that I thought might give us some interesting material, but I didn't find any. I'm also not an expert. It's not, it's not a well-learned tractate. It's the tractate which is called um, uh, I'm blanking on the name now. It's it, 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 it's a tractate that deals with what happens when, not when the individual makes a mistake, but what happens when the um, uh, uh, when the community makes a mistake, when the priests make a mistake, and what kind of reparations need to be made. Um, 
why can't I think of the name of the track name now? Anyway, we'll set that aside because I didn't find anything that I that I thought was pertinent. Where I, you do find what I think is pertinent to our topic of tshuva, of repentance, is the tractate that is devoted primarily to the Day of Atonement, to Yom Kippur. Um, and it, its name is Yoma, which in Aramaic means the day, because that is the day of the year, is the Day of Atonement. And um, there are laws there that pertain to fasting and not washing on that day and those kinds of things. There's a lot of laws that pertain to the sacrifices because that was a the major day in the priestly uh, uh, parts of, of, of Judaism. And there, there's this one section here that I, I trimmed down tremendously. This What I have here is trimmed down, nine, this is 10% maybe. Uh, of of the section, the, the entire section that deals, that goes on and on, these conversations about tshuva. Um, and I tried to do prune it in such a way that it would be helpful. I don't think we'll do everything, but we'll take a look at it. Okay, if that's all right. So um, so would you like to read uh, uh, John, John Kent? Just need you to unmute first. John, you're muted. Sorry, we're at uh, 85B, 86B. Right, Babylonian Talmud, that's the corpus, the great thing. The Yoma is the tractate, and it's 85, 85B to 86B because the, in the Talmud, it's one page, is a, is the, the pages are numbered in their side A and side B to each folio. Go ahead. Okay, Mishnah. A sin offering which atones for unwitting performance of transgressions punishable by carrot being cut off and a definite guilt offering, which is brought for robbery and misuse of consecrated items, atone for those sins. Death and Yom Kippur atone for sins when accompanied by repentance. Repentance itself atones for minor transgressions, for both positive mitzvot and negative mitzvot commandments. And repentance places punishment for severe transgressions in abeyance until Yom Kippur comes and completely atones for the transgression. Okay, so we have to just talk about that. There's different levels. We, everybody in the world wants to be atoned for. That's how the cosmos is balanced again. When you sin, the cosmos gets out of balance. So how do you do it? There's different things that happen in different ways that you get atoned. So let's just start with the easy. For the minor infractions, it's enough of, for you to repent. That is, you have to make amends. You've got, if it's something uh, monetary, uh, but in your heart, you have to not do it. And we'll get to a section later on that says exactly when do we know when somebody has repented or not repented, which I think brings us to why, uh, why I'm bringing this entire section about Acts 3. Um, and so the repentance, sometimes it needs Yom Kippur. Sometimes it needs death. And so much of the chapter uh, of this section ahead, uh, the discussion on the Mishnah, what are the various situations in which one can be? Uh, just to give you an idea, if somebody is desecrates the name of heaven in public, and, and one of the examples given that I didn't bring here is that the rabbi said, if I, for instance, and I'm known as a Torah scholar, and I walk in the street and, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm not conducting myself in a, in, a, in a dignified way, that is a travesty, that is a desecration of, the, of, of heaven in public. Right? Others would say eating, you know, a rabbi sitting in a restaurant eating, uh, you know, a ham and cheese sandwich with, with, with shrimp cocktail beforehand, everything, you know, all the different kinds of things. Or, or one might say other things as well, which people have often said about different rabbis and, and different Orthodox Jews in, in, in contemporary society. Um, but, uh, but, but the idea is that there's different levels, different things that need to be done. Peter, of course, is not talking about all this. He's in the context. Remember, he's in the portico of Solomon. He's in the temple complex. And this is what you come to the temple for very often. We always think of people coming for the sake of, of the pilgrimage, the holiday pilgrimage. And yes, from the diaspora, that was when they came. But the ongoing sacrifices, offerings, not all of them, but many of them had to do with things you did wrong, things that needed to be atoned for. And the big day, the Super Bowl of the temple, which doesn't really come out. I, did, I don't know if the Gospels talk about Yom Kippur. I can't remember, but the, the, the Super Bowl of, of the priests and, and, and the Temple in Jerusalem was Day of Atonement. It, it, I, just as an aside, uh, Stephen, is that discussed at all 
in New Testament literature? Maybe not in so many words, but I do think uh, whether it be in the book of Hebrews or or even with the, uh, uh, the, the tearing of the curtain that separates the Holy of Holies at, at the death of Jesus, I think they're, they're getting at, the, at that atonement. Right, but not Yom Kippur though, though, right? Not the Day of Atonement per se. Not necessarily in, in, in those terms. Right, so, right. so one might, I say this because that was certainly, all the Jewish literature points to that being key as does biblical issue before and when one reads what one one's education of of what was happening in the temple 2000 years ago is from the new testament alone it's 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 uh, it's it's rather narrow it's relatively narrow because the main thing were the sacrifice the people offering all those all the the tables that were overturned the money changers were there for not <laughs> They weren't there like, uh, you know, those machines in the casino that I see people. I'm in the casino a lot because there's a concert space in the casino near us where we're, Orham Ibar is having a, a fundraiser. We're doing a concert there and I and I often go to the blues and jazz concerts there. So I, I see, I, I'm not attracted to it, but I see that people go to this machine on the side and they get, I, I don't I don't think they're getting chips. They're getting some credit card kind of a thing. But maybe that people think that's where the money changes. The money changes that Jesus was so upset with were had more to do with with everybody being able to bring the the, the half shekel offering once a year. Had to do with paying for stuff that was the, the all the things that needed to be done for people to bring their offerings to the temple. That sometimes gets obscured. I think in 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 New Testament literature about Jerusalem. Anyway. Yom Kippur is essential. Death sometimes, you can't be excused, you can't be atoned for it until you die in some cases. Um, but let's leave that up in the air and let's continue. We're still in the Mishnah, we're still in the, this, this collection of, of traditions from the year 200. Go ahead, John. With regard to one who says, I will sin and then I will repent. I will sin and I will repent. Heaven does not provide him the opportunity to repent and he will remain a sinner all his days. With regard to one who says, I will sin and Yom Kippur will atone for my sins, Yom Kippur does not atone for his sins. Furthermore, for transgressions between a person and God, Yom Kippur atones. However, for transgressions between a person and another, Yom Kippur does not atone until he, he appeases the other person. Similarly, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria taught that point from the verse, from all your sins, you shall be cleansed before the Lord, Leviticus 1630. For transgressions between a person and God, Yom Kippur atones. However, for transgressions between a person and another, Yom Kippur does not atone until he appeases the other person. In conclusion, Rabbi Akiva said, How fortunate are you, Israel, before whom are you purified, and who purifies you? It is your Father in heaven, as it is stated, and I will sprinkle purifying water upon you, and you shall be purified. Ezekiel 36.25 and it says, the ritual bath of Israel is God, Jeremiah 17, 13. Just as a ritual bath purifies the impure, so too the Holy One, blessed be he, purifies Israel. I'm guessing that those of you that have never read this before, and, I'm, and there probably are those who kind of say, feel comfortable with much of this language, right? Other than the fact that Jesus isn't mentioned, and the fact that Yom Kippur is stuck in there, this this is second century rabbinic material, which is a reaction to the temple, an alternate reaction to the temple than Peter's and, Je and, 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 and the early acts and Jesus' reaction to the temple, which is, folks, you're getting it wrong. You've gone down the wrong path. And, um, and, and so uh, I think what I want to say is that while the, much, some of the New Testament is focused on the Jews, be, those Jews being responsible for the death of, uh, and not accepting Christ. Um, everybody kind of, or many people agreed, there was a problem. 
It wasn't that there was no problem. There was a problem. The solutions offered were different. That's kind of what I wanted to bring in this, this particular passage. Again, this is not exactly from, from the time of Acts. This is a, a, a few decades later, but it's Rabbi Akiva is, is, is first half of the second century common era. And also, this gives you an opportunity. I think many people have heard the name Rabbi Akiva before. It gives you an opportunity to see, at least in our tradition, what is said to be his words. But the reason it feels familiar, I think, from a Christian point of view, is that is that much of Christian liturgy and sermons today as well, but also uh, the Gospels themselves, and, 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 and I think are based on the same material, right? There's just a dis slightly different interpretation. What's missing but here, I would of course... I also say that I think there's a lot of similarities here. There, we're talking about you know, that idea of right relationship, which doesn't happen until there's true repentance, true metanoia, true opening of the heart, appeasing the other, uh, restoring the relationship, and, uh, you know, repentance from the inside out, not not just token or, or, or purely outside in. So there is, uh, I, I feel uh, a kindred spirit with, with this text. Right, right. I, I, I ask about that issue of Yom Kippur because in some ways, and I go, I know this is, I, I'm pretty sure there's a later development that, in, that um, or maybe I, let me ask you instead, see, from when do we start to have in New Testament literature the idea that um, people are, are, they're purified from their sins merely because, through Jesus? Well, is that, that's not from the beginning, right? Right. So is that is that is that in Acts already that idea is that I'm I'm really unclear about the development I don't know if it's in other uh, words it, ask it, that question one can you phrase that one more yeah time? yeah I know I didn't do it well so when you, in, in our section here we have it's it's it very much that um, day the day of atonement atones for your sins as well as you've got to repent and all the things you've got to do different things you've got to change your behavior. But you will be, you will receive atonement through the through Yom Kippur. No longer through the temple at this time, but through Yom Kippur, in a cosmic level. At some point in 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 Christianity, one receives atonement from a belief in 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 Jesus. Right? Is Jesus a savior? And Jesus died for the sins. Jesus dies atonement. When does that start to happen? Is that that's not from the beginning, right? Not at all. It no. it, it happens. Um, I, I don't know when exactly, but but uh, it, it's not in the text per se. In fact, uh, many scholars who are Christian would would say uh, the the cr cross was not about atonement per se. And as soon as we in the Christian world, identify you believe in Jesus's death on that cross, that that atones for your sins, then you're you're saved forever, right? And 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 so there's almost a mechanistic uh, formula that that uh, restores you and is, but but it reduces it to right belief, and I think it it creates a singularity for Jesus that isn't there in the earlier uh, text as, as well. I think Jesus is clearly in the line of the prophets. There's clarity. There, there's definitely a, a revelation of, of God's uh, uh, beauty and God's love in Jesus, but to reduce it to right belief is, is where the it came off the rails. And, and I think that contributes to that separation, that split that, that we begin to see at the end of this book in particular. Steve, uh, define right belief in that context. Well, it's like uh, back in college, right? Uh, uh, there, there's uh, evangelical groups that, that go around and they say, uh, it, you know, God has a plan for your life. Uh, problem is you're separated from God because of sin a uh, solution god has laid down a bridge jesus and if you believe and he died for your sin so if you believe that he did do that then you are saved that's what i mean by right belief you believe that formula then and and it kind of divorces behavior 
from belief at that point. And, and I think, again, going back to the broken heart that's in the Beatitudes, the, that's, in Jerem, that's in all the prophets, the, the contrite and broken heart pleases God because there's humility, there, there's openness to the other, there's a relationship that can happen. And, and so just, just believing the right things versus all those who don't believe what I believe, they're going to hell. You see, that, that's that zero-sum game that, that, that has distorted it, uh, I think, in a sad sort of way. Donald, you had a thought? Yeah. Um, you know, the idea of, being, of having behavior divorced from belief uh, is is really, uh, I think, tied into the uh, sacrifice of Jesus, uh, as it is described. Whereas in the Hebrew tradition, uh, that sacrifice is repeated year in and year out. Um, Christians don't believe that anything more is necessary than Jesus's atoning death. Uh, so we get away from behavior once you accept uh, the theological fact of uh, what the tradition holds. And, I, I, and I, the Hebrew tradition, uh, to me, concentrating on the humanistic aspect of, of our relationship to others um, is more of a discipline and more of a, uh, of a, a reality that should be followed in our life. I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. So, yeah, so, made, made sense to me, Donald. Uh, yeah, per, perhaps maybe to, that, that's kind of a way maybe for us to bring this whole conversation together is it looking in the last paragraph uh, that I brought for you today. Uh, this last paragraph, the, the idea is quite um, well known in Jewish circles, but not through the Talmud. It's because Maimonides and uh, in medieval uh, Egypt, he gave expression to it in a very, in a, in a much more orderly fashion, uh, in in determining in, in his laws of repentance. He has he has laws, the different laws. Of, he distilled all the Babylonian Talmud into different aspects of life, including things that didn't apply in his age because the temple was no longer uh, uh, standing. He, he wrote it in a Hebrew, which was the considered to be the simplest and most easily easiest understood Hebrew that we have. Not biblical Hebrew, but the Hebrew of the Mishnah, the same Hebrew of the section that we did beforehand. And and this is what, um, so Donald, why don't you read the section for us at the very bottom? Um, Rabbi Hammer? No, uh, what, what are the circumstances? Uh, I see, oh yeah. What are the circumstances that demonstrate that one has completely repented? Rav Yehuda said, for example, the prohibited matter came to his hand the first time and the second time, and he was saved from it. Rav Yehuda demonstrated what he meant. If one has the opportunity to sin with the same woman he sinned with previously at the same time and the same place, and everything is aligned as it was that first time when he sinned, but this time he overcomes his inclination. It proves his repentance is complete and he is forgiven. Now, now we might have a wonderful time in discussing why it is that of all the examples he could have brought, this is the example that was brought. But we understand the example. We understand especially because the urge, the sexual urge and, and to do. But but when do we know when somebody is really repented? When they are in the exact same situation, not a totally different situation, like they had a stomach ache or they were in full, but whatever it is. And uh, and this this has become a, 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 a well-known, through Maimonides, come well-known in Jewish circles. But I bring this back to our text because it seems to me that the author, in placing Peter's sermon at the porticos of Solomon, the same we don't we only have we have it we'll have it in chapter five as well. And there's a passage in John which I brought the last time uh, uh, the sheet from last week as well that has Jesus' position there was which kind of I'm taking permission from that to say uh, Peter is talking to the people in the same place where it happened, the same conditions, the gathering. Of the time of prayer people the throngs are in the temple this is where it happened 
and and this is where you need to repent in the same place the same situation when when jesus uh, expecting jesus to come again at, at any moment i think so um to, to me that that that's my at least my my rabbinic mind work that way why why do we have why why is it why is the text bother to tell us it was in the particles of solomon which are the eastern part of the of, of, of the temple structure um and become a place in Acts where the, the, it seems like that's the place where they gathered. That that was the clubhouse, so to speak, in the temple. Reactions or questions, comments? Yes, Eileen. Um, and he is forgiven, and that's part of um, repentance. But where's the repair? Where's the apology? Where's the final act? What, how are you going to say, I'm not going to do it again? You can mit, not do it again, but how are you going to apologize in this case to the woman or whatever, however you have sinned? Yeah, it, it, it's not mentioned here because it's not thought to be a woman, of course, is objectified in this situation. She's not a party, yes? I, and, and, and maybe we would add that on today. That would be interesting to see what, what modern scholars say about this passage now or Maimonides in, in, in playing it out. Those that, those that are conscious of gender equality and yet want to stick to the law. There aren't a lot of scholars like that, but... but, but I yeah. didn't mean that specifically. I meant you yeah. go for you, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you... You pray for repentance. You apologize, but how 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 do you actually? So 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 in other words, I think what the, what 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 Rav Yehud is saying here, the, the the immediate answer to your question is what was stated in in the tradition before, and you've got to make amends with if it's a, between another person, you have to make amends, whatever that is. You've got whether it's apology, paying back, it doesn't specify here. As far as God's concerned. You're making amends is it's through the prayer is that all the all the 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 it, what became Judaism the the 30 40 days of of repentance before Yom Kippur the the special prayers of asking forgiveness all the things that you know Eileen from the Jewish tradition but the Yom Kippur prayer alone the constant Ashamnu Bagannu Gazalnu the the confession that we do in different literary forms poetic forms that that's where that is here that that's not mentioned in this particular text but um but i think that ravi Yud is saying something beyond that you can apologize all you want you can say you're sorry you can say in your heart i'm not going to do this again all you want but the test is for the person who is uh, an alcoholic is to be in a situation where there is alcohol and people won't judge the person it won't say anything to him or he's on his own. He's in the same place and yet he doesn't take a drink. I just thought of that, I, I don't, you know, but, you know, um, it, it, you could say all you want. I'm not going to do it. You could say the, the, the you know, the, the, the 12 step prayer. You could read, read 12, the, the, that literature, the big book as much as you want. But until you're in the time when you're tested, in other words, the proof is in the pudding, I guess, if I can use it that way. Thank you. The pudding of atonement. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for being here. And uh, I, I think next week we can begin chapter four, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. God bless you all. All right. God bless you too. Thank you.